first and foremost, looking after ourselves, making sure that when we're up on hill, we are safe and also that we're keeping other people safe too. Um, nothing worse than getting up on the hill for a day, not having your helmet on, taking a fall, bit of a concussion, which can happen, really, really commonplace. You lose out on the rest of your holiday. It's just about keeping you safe. When we move into some of the other protective equipment as well, we're talking back protectors and the like, they're also to keep you safe from others. You see your little crash, someone comes in behind you, loses a bit of control, that's gonna keep you safe in that little um, occurrence as well. We've also got our gloves, some sun cream, face masks, all these things to keep us nice and safe and protected, get you from start to finish of your holiday in one piece, ready to go again when you're back on snow. Having a think about those ski holidays that we all enjoy, only being a couple of days long, seems to be the average. If you hurt yourself on the first day and that costs you those days, you know, a head injury is easy to assume that that's gonna get you off the mountain, but it could be simple, something as simple as bruising. Like if you just bruise your knees repeatedly, then you're not gonna wanna ride or not be able to ride as well the next day. So it's pretty important to consider all those factors if you're gonna make the effort getting out there on a ski trip to enjoy it as much as you can. Stand safe. All right, so obviously I'm gonna talk about a Smith helmet tonight. So I'm gonna run over a few things around the features, the benefits of specific helmets, and then also fit and what you should be looking for when you come into the store to try them on. So coming into the store to try them on is obvious. It's like buying a hat. It's gotta fit correctly. You can't have extra space in and around the helmet and your head shape is gonna help you decide what helmet to choose when you're in the store. You should be looking for things based on your holiday choices, like how long are you gonna be spending on the mountain? Is it five days? Is it 20 days? That should help you decide one, how much to spend on a helmet based on how much use it's gonna get. Um, and then the fit as well. So in the back of this one, we have a BOA 360 fit. So that's just getting the helmet to fit nice and snug all around your head, keeping it on safe when you do take an impact. If it's moving, that's not ideal. We've also got choroid in this helmet. So that's an impact protection material that's inside the helmet. So it's extremely light and um, well, well ventilated, but also on impact, it's gonna dissipate a lot of energy and keep that away from your skull and your brain. So it's super important to do anything you can to stop those injuries happening. Technically, three to five years is about when you'd want to tap them out, but if you've had a big spill on it, then you should really consider replacing it almost immediately. So you want to look for stress fractures in and around the EPS or anything obvious on the outer shell is going to give that away too. I mean, when it comes to the crunch, you know, we're only talking about a small amount of money compared to what your head's worth to you. Depending on the person, which is why you need to come in store and talk to the lights of Andrew to make sure that you are buying something specific to your needs. But if you look for bombshell construction, it's got a good dense exterior and it's good for repeated knocks and people that are tending towards the park. Yeah, some key features um, just to look out for would be the helmet that Pablo's got here in his hand is MIPS. And um, that's one of the multi kind of impact directional protection systems you've got in helmets any kind of impact where your head is hitting the ground at speed and force as pablo's demonstrating here usually your head would rotate inside the helmet so if you're coming off a jump and you're learning you're probably going to have a few little spills usually your head would move inside that helmet and that's what's going to lean itself towards and um, causing concussions the mips is going to help mitigate that it's not going to remove it completely but does massively reduce the amount of stress on the brain so that you can then get up and hit that jump again without feeling all kind of dazed and a little bit kind of woozy from it. It can turn what would be a normal impact into a glancing blow as well. So when you do hit the ground, if it turns and then dissipates that energy in the right direction. So if you own a helmet, but you're thinking about going to buy goggles, you should take your helmet into the store to make sure that the new goggles you're gonna purchase fit inside your helmet, if that makes sense. And then vice versa, if you own goggles, but you're going to buy a helmet, take the goggles in to make sure they fit. They're pretty generic across the board, so most brands will fit in amongst others. But if you can get them to integrate, which is Smith's call out, you know, his ultimate integration, then they're gonna work the best together, so brand for brand. So we have what's called air evac, so the heat that comes up out the top of your goggles will go into the helmet and then out the top. Yeah, another little awesome point to pick up on that one, Pablo's touched on the airflow and anti-fog sun obviously bright you get that glare and, and burn back from the, the sun bouncing off the snow having that gap you're kind of opening yourself up it's minor as it may be to maybe some sunburn sunburn across your head trust me with this complexion i've had plenty of it coming from from scotland um is pretty horrendous um, like so exactly these little gaps and also even at a recreational level you're st still picking up a fair amount of speed as you're going down the hill 
even just that wind chill can start to cool your actual body temperature as well. Um, which again, all of this little minor factors will play into how well you're going to operate on the hill, the decisions you're going to make and how safe you're going to be. The VLT is the visible light transfer. So it's the amount of light that's being allowed into your eyes through the lens. So all lenses will have a VLT rating. So if you get a blackout lens for sunny weather, it's not going to allow much light to come into your eyes, but it's going to suit sunny weather. Conversely, if you get a storm lens, it's going to have a high VLT rating. It's going to allow a lot of light, natural light to come into your eyes so that you can actually see where you're going, even in poor weather. As a general, Hopefully that makes sense. Yeah, as a general rule of thumb as well, if we're kind of just talking colors of lenses, which is a really easy way that a lot of the guys in the store will deal with this one. Your black lenses and red lenses, to Pablo's point about blackouts, they're going to be your key core lenses for those bright bluebird sunny days. Your blues and greens, um, some maybe kind of violet -y colors, they're going to be your variable lenses. Put that one lens in, unless it's super bluebird bright day or can't see your hand in front of your face fog, those lenses, like is in this, it's going to keep you sweet. And then your oranges, pinks and clears will be for the very North Island days that we're used to up here. Fog, bit of snow coming in, those lenses are going to give the most amount of light through into your eyes. This is an expensive pair of lenses. If you're going to go out and buy it, you're going to treat it with some respect, I would hope. So you should never clean a goggle lens with anything other than the microfiber bag or cloth that you can buy to do that. Nothing, not your t-shirt, not a napkin in the cafe, it will 100% scratch your lens and then you're going to reduce the clarity and you know the use of having goggles in the first place. So be really careful with the lenses, always store them in your bag and then when they're safely tucked in your bag you can also tuck it in your helmet to store it inside your bag or in your car. Wiping your goggles when they're wet, had a little fall, you stacked it, not advisable to wipe that lens clean. Um, that can, in some cases, start peeling that coating that is on some of the lenses off a little bit. It's gonna start getting these scratch marks and smudge marks. If you get snow on it, had a little fall, as much as possible, shake it off. If you've got a removable lens, flap it around the air, pop it back on, on your helmet, make sure that it's all tucked up and fitting properly. And that airflow that Pablo talked about earlier is going to start pulling that moisture off the lens that will naturally dry it once it's dry get rid of the smear marks you'll be good as gold for the next day on snow moving down the body and to kind of what the we're protecting and why we're protecting it might seem like a bit of an oversight but a buff a face mask buff as a brand and um, plenty of these on the market different styles with hoods some that are actually going to snap onto certain models of goggles with little magnets as well making sure that you are nice and protected. This one in particular has got some UV protection built into it as well. So it's gonna help bounce back all of those rays. Sun cream, as a ginger person, that is my best friend. Back to 50 plus, perfect. Uh, just about for me, just about. <laughs> Wallpaper paste, I would usually need. Um, but yeah, 50 plus, um, especially for being up on the mountains, even if you don't normally get burned, the glare of the sun bouncing back off the snow can be actually pretty brutal at times. Um, even if you are used to being out in the sun, you're going to get burnt. It's almost inevitable. Um, making sure you're nice and protected. All those bits that are probably going to catch the sun, back of the neck as well, if you don't have a little face mask or your buff style neck warmer, making sure that you're all covered over. Gloves should hopefully be nice and self-explanatory why you should wear them, but sometimes it's not. The amount of people you do see, even up at Snow Planet, it's not out on the mountain, but not wearing gloves, pretty risky. So we've got two sets here, both from PAL, one of the brands that we stock at Torpedo 7. Whole host of brands you can pick up as well, depending on your fit and your size and your style. We've got a glove for the more traditional look and also your mitt. Only real difference between the two, a mitt will keep your hand a little bit warmer, just as a point of difference with having your fingers all kept together and not splitting them off. So if you do suffer from kind of colder extremities and you know that you're going to get cold fingers, probably advisable going for a mitt. Your downside though is you will reduce some of that dexterity. Um, so a snowboarder, for example, we are usually wearing mitts to be yep. fair, um, but you do lose that um, dexterity. Yeah, Don't need to. not as essential. No. Um, but for skiers, having that grip can be a bit ham-fisted when you're trying to hold onto them like that. So that's where your gloves come in as well. If you know you get cold hands and you're going for a glove option though, 
plenty of liners that you can get, super thin, almost next to skin style um, glove liners, a couple of different brands at T7 that we stock, um, try and go for as much as possible in the Reno um, fit on those ones as well, or material, and that's going to keep your hands nice and cool, wick that moisture off, because your hands will get sweaty. It's a hot sport, despite doing it in winter. Um, having that merino one there is going to help cool that sweat off your hand, making sure that when you jump into the cafe to grab your glue vine or your tea, your cup's not going to slip out your hand. Um, so gloves there, and then the obvious reasons, keep you warm, keep you dry, at least get a waterproof glove. You do see folk up there with gloves you can wring out and water dripping through them. Snow feels dry, but it is obviously water. Um, and as soon as you start compacting that, that water will start being pushed out. You're going to get wet pretty quick, especially at the end of the season in those spring conditions. So if you can, stretch on the price tag a little bit, get a glove with Gore-Tex. That's going to guarantee to keep you dry all the way through your day while you're up on the hill. To one of Andrew's points, you all know if you get cold or not, because we're all different, right? So if you don't get that cold, then you might be able to get away with a thinner glove that still has a leather exterior. Yeah. Um, whereas your partner might get cold, so you know they're going to need a warmer glove, perhaps mitts or a liner to go inside. Then add your kids into the mix. Now, who's going to spend the most time with their hands in the snow? It's absolutely going to be your children. So they're going to be picking up snowballs, they're going to be eating ice, they're going to be throwing it around, they're going to get soaked. So really, the, the people that need it most, that's where you put the money essentially, or the thought process behind it, into getting those people with the gloves that are going to work well. This card that we've got here, stock at Trapeter 7. So with these, just a couple of Velcro straps, undo those. These are sized, so you're gonna get a small, a medium, a large um, in the adults ones, and there is also a kid's equivalent as well. Little hand loop to make sure that you can pull it on. This is probably a bit big for me to be fair, but just to show that, on it goes. And then this hard pad, you wanna make sure that that's round about the heel um, back area of your hand. I'm sure it's got the heel, I think it is. Hand heel. Hand heel. Uh, making sure that that pad is round about that area. Get it on nice and tight. There we go. So that's my wrist guard on. There's a Dekine glove that Torpedo 7 stocks that has a wrist guard built in. So there's not a glove in particular that is better for going over a wrist guard. That is purely down to, which you guys can't control unfortunately, the manufacturers and how wide they've made that wrist opening. And then also the wrist guards that you're buying, how bulky they are. Some of them can be pretty sizable and getting a glove over that can be pretty difficult. Um, sizing up in your glove to fit over a wrist guard also isn't that recommended. Um, if the glove isn't fitting properly, you are gonna lose that ability for it to keep you as warm and dry as possible. Impact shorts, the next little bit of the protection we'll be talking about. These are, even after 18 years on snow, I still wear mine, even if I'm not riding park as often as I was. For me, this is now more a confidence thing. I'm used to wearing them. I feel a little bit naked if I don't have mine on, even just cruising around Snow Planet. So what these are there to do is to reduce any of the impact you're gonna get on your thighs, your bum area, so specifically your coccyx as well, your tailbone. Um, and then just all the little kind of muscles and bits around about your glutes or your bum. So these will all be made in some form or another of a impact dispersing foam, similar to what we uh, Pablo talked about earlier with the choroid that's in some of the helmets. So we take that impact and it spreads that point of impact across the area of the pad. Um, so instead of hitting straight onto there, it takes that impact pushes it out, larger area, less harm to you. And the m main areas that people are gonna be falling over on, it's your bum. When you're skiing, you're snowboarding, you're gonna be sitting down, falling off to the side. So learning, these are awesome. Um, where these are also really, really commonplace are, as I touched on a little bit earlier, with um, freestyle riders, either skiers or snowboarders riding the park. Super, super common to see someone on the end of a little box, trying their first board slide, board skips out or their skis. Okay. And the first thing to catch that is gonna be your coccyx, your bum. Nothing worse, trust me, from experience, having broken tailbone and a bruise on your backside that doesn't go away for about eight weeks. The material that the shorts are made of is a wicking material that is gonna pull the sweat and moisture away, but it's not inherently a thermal. It's not really gonna keep you that warm. Um, so still having a base layer bottom, 
either a three quarter or a full length one, depending on what you're into, um, is gonna be paramount to making sure that you are kept nice and dry and warm at the same time. Yeah, they're useful, 100%. Personally, I haven't used them. If you've fallen on ice on your knees before, then but, there's, yeah, there's a need, there's a need. Um, definitely useful. Especially when learning. Yeah, without a doubt. Yeah. Um, learning, all of this stuff is useful at any time, but when you're learning, it's making those mistakes, um, which are more common. You're learning, you're gonna make the odd little mistake here or there. These are really, really good making sure that your knees are all kept in one piece. Similar to the impact short that we talked about, it's gonna take that impact, just reduce it from your knee. Your knees are bony, there's not a lot of protection there. So making sure that they're kept nice and safe, bruised knee, gonna give you a bit of bother being up riding for the next day. Definitely a good thing to have. Definitely recommend a Merino base layer. Plenty of options on the market, you can get your poly props as well but your merino ones are gonna be the best at wicking that moisture off and actually regulating your temperature to keep you nice and even throughout the um, entire day on the snow. Base layers, you'll get them in long sleeve, short sleeve, and for your bottoms, you'll get a full length, also get a three quarter length, um, really common for mainly kind of skiers. Most mm, of the folk I've seen wearing them, yeah. to be fair, um, but those kind of stiffer cuffed boots having that full length um, thermal down into it can sometimes cause some pinching and some kind of rucking in the fabric, create some little pressure points. So again, like it seems minor, but you don't want to be uncomfortable while you're out on the snow. So if you're finding that your long thermal that you've got, you're getting a few little kind of pinching bits around about your ankle or your calf, maybe have a look at some of the three quarter length ones just to ease that up a little bit. Thermals are going to keep a layer of heat really close to your skin by wearing them tight and then that heat isn't going to disappear. So if it's stay nice and close to you, keep you warm, and then you layer that up. So layering is actually one of the real importances over having one big jacket over a cotton t-shirt, for instance. Definitely. Getting them working together. Talking equipment, 100% that's a part of keeping you safe. The other half is actually knowing the do's and don'ts while you're actually out on the hill. So a few of those main points to cover off. One of the first ones would be ride within your limits, making sure that yeah, super important especially for us guys mm. trying to overshoot now i'll do that run probably not the best if you're not that comfortable with capable. it yeah. yeah so starting out stick to those blues and greens if you've not been off the big jumps before maybe keep it a little bit friendly on the smaller kickers till you start progressing and feeling more confident making sure that if you are venturing off piece a little bit as well that you're actually informing people of where you're going and who you're with and that kind of a bit of a buddy system style thing as well heading off that kind of side country bit, maybe over that little hill off the back of the tow line, making sure that you've got someone with you that if something goes wrong, you've got some folk around to raise for help and um, make sure that you're not gonna be stuck down there on your own. A couple of on slope points as well, making sure that you're giving way to the people below you. Nothing worse than you just cruising around, taking your time and someone cuts you up from the back. And um, so just making sure that you're giving way to the folk that you can see below you. And if you are gonna stop, really important one if you fall over or you take a little breather move to the side or as far off the main slope as you possibly can making sure that the rest of the slope is free for all the rest of the hill goers to be um, using safely again keeps you safe keeps um, others safe while you're up on the hill as well yeah that hazard is coming from above you so you want to be sure that you can be seen by the people above you as they're skiing or snowboarding down if they can't see you there's an opportunity for them to hit you by accident so be very careful about where you park up well that's done, us for tonight guys thanks so much for joining in thanks to pablo thanks everyone for yeah. joining us all the information and we'll see you out there thank you see you out there